little bit different. I know you feel like you had to deal with curveballs all, but you're still sitting right here in the front. I mean, so it's uh, you've chosen wisely. But it's good to see everybody tonight. Uh, we're going to do uh, something a, a touch different, not really all that different. We're going to have God's Word open it, and we're going to study from it. And in that, you know, is the same in a lot of ways. But I do want us to consider a few things tonight. We, we have, over the last year, I guess, uh, John and I done several question and answer uh, periods. Three, I think. Is that right? Three, I believe. And each time, we've gotten great questions, really, really good questions, and we'll plan to do that again uh, sometime in the future for sure. And every time that we've gotten questions, they've been good, and sometimes they've been questions that we've been able to cover uh, as we have publicly, where we could take a couple of questions and, and get those answered in you know, 10 or 15 minutes each. And, and other questions that we have gotten have at times been really a, a little bit bigger of a question. Um, I may or may not have made mention of it, and you, if you were the one asking the question, you certainly may have noticed, but a couple of those questions have really been the springboard for lessons that we've done on Sunday mornings, and uh, you know thoughts that we have, and other questions we've tried to fit in in other ways, and trying to cover as many of those questions in as many formats as we can. Well, several question and answers ago... One of the questions that we got was specifically about angels and their role today. What role do angels play in the life of a Christian? And a couple of months ago, on a Sunday night, much like this, I was standing up there and not down here, but a couple of, Sunday, uh, a couple of months ago on a Sunday evening, I kind of began answering that question with some foundational things that the Bible has to say about angels. What, what are they? What, what are they all about? Uh, what, what is their job description? What, what do we see them doing biblically? And we spent, you know, 20 or 25 minutes or so just kind of laying the groundwork about angels in general. And I made mention then that at a time in the future, we'll come back and revisit that specific question which we're going to do tonight. I've made mention when I was going through that particular study a couple of months ago, I believe I was standing up here, and it really came across as kind of a teaching moment. We were going through God's Word and just kind of making mention of times that we see referenced angels and what they were doing, and for some reason, it just felt odd being up there. Uh, I don't know why. It's, I don't know. I have no answer for it, but I remember telling John afterwards, I'm not going to do that again, and here I am, true to my word. We will try it from down here to maybe, personally, I'll feel more comfortable. So it's all about me. It's all about me tonight. Well, the reason I'm down here, it's all about me. It's not all about me. So we're going to kind of tackle that question over the next few minutes. What does the Bible have to say about angels and their role in our lives today? Do they have any role in our lives today? Do, do, they, do they have any impact on what our life is today? And if so, does the Bible say anything about that? Or are we just in a position to speculate about what their role is? If you remember a couple of months ago when we kind of began talking about angels, it's one of those interesting things that there tends to be a lot of speculation about angels themselves, so not just what they look like. There's lots of speculation about that, but even what their job is, what their role is. And I made mention then, it's kind of interesting that we kind of fall into that trap because the reality is the Bible has a lot to say about angels. It isn't like, hey, there's one reference to angels in the Old Testament and let's cover that. And there's one reference in the New Testament, we'll kind of cover that passage. Lots of times angels are mentioned in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so what that tells us, there shouldn't be any need for speculation. We should be able to go to God's Word to, to learn and to grow and to see if God, he, he wants us to have that understanding about what their role is. And so that simple question, what their role is today, we will attempt to answer that in the few minutes that we have. We're going to start in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 is going to be a passage that we're going to start with. And it is a passage, the main reason I want to start with it is I want you to keep it in your mind throughout the entirety of our study tonight together. 
I want you to keep this passage, Romans chap, or Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. It is a passage that often comes up when talking about angels. There's another big one in the book of Matthew that we will also spend some time on specifically. But this one here in the book of Hebrews, I want to start with it because I want you to keep it in your mind. We're going to continually reference it because I think it is a key component to answering our question tonight. I'm in Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, and we'll also read verse 14 as well. It says, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? And so you have an interesting passage here. As the Hebrew writer, in a lot of ways here at this passage in context of the book of Hebrews, is making the point that Jesus is superior to the angels. That he is a superior in every way. As the Hebrew writer will continue to go and he will continue to bring up things that we kind of elevate to make the point that Jesus is superior to that. And it kind of works his way through lots of things. And here in this context, he's discussing angels. And a point here is made about what their role is. And there is something interesting that's said in verse 14 that I do want you to keep in your mind where the Hebrew writer says they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. So how do they do that, right? I mean, that's the question. How does that happen? How does that happen? Does that happen today? Does that happen only with the people who are reading this letter in the first century? How does that take place? Well, let's expand that thought. And I want to look in the book of Acts, the early church, and to see the role that angels played as they popped up at various moments in the book of Acts, as the early church was multiplying and being added to and, and daily expanding, you'll often see angels popping up. We're going to start in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, there's an example that certainly you find some of Christ's followers finding themselves in prison and being freed from that by God through the ministering of angels. Look at Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. In Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, it says, that The high priest rose up, and all those who were with them, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night... An angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priests and those with them came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. And so you see here in Acts chapter 5, the apostles being put into prison and God freeing them from that by sending an angel to do that deed as well as to deliver a message, right? You want you to go and to to continue to teach. We're not going to read this passage, but if you're taking notes, you can make a note of Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 12, a very similar thing takes place, where there is a a freedom from prison with the use of an angel. I want to look at a couple other passages, and then we'll kind of make a point in general as a whole. I want you now to look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And so you hear you have angels in the early church being used as kind of provided deliverance from prison. But also they were involved in conversion that we see. In Acts chapter 8, there's an interesting passage at the very outset of this story. And listen to what's said. I'm in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. 26 down through 28. Acts chapter 8, 26, beginning. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise. And go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. And so he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, 
who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And so Philip comes in contact with this man from Ethiopia. They have a conversation about where it is and what he was reading from Scripture, specifically Jesus. He was touched by that gospel message and he was baptized into Christ. But we're told at the beginning of that, it was an angel of the Lord who spoke to Philip and delivered that message, and sent him on his way. Again, we're not going to read this passage, but if you look in Acts chapter 10 and 11, throughout the story of Cornelius' conversion, angels are at work with both Peter and messages, as well as Cornelius and messages. And so here you see conversion, them being used as well. Now Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Something, again, very different from the others, but still a very interesting passage with reference to angels at the time of the early church. I'm in Acts chapter 12 now, beginning in verse 21. It says, So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, The voice of a God and not of a man. And then immediately... An angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. Now again, this passage is very different from what we have read already. One, you had an angel being involved in the deliverance from prison, angels involved in conversion of both the eunuch as well as Cornelius, and now they're kind of an instrument of judgment, if you will. But again, them playing this part. Acts chapter 27, getting down to the very end of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 27 now. We're going to begin our reading in verse 21 of this text. Acts chapter 27 and verse 21 beginning. But after long abstinence from food, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid. Paul, you must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. And so here again, now at the very end of the book of Acts, Paul finds himself on a ship, and they are in grave trouble. But he has received reassurance at night from this angel of God. And it's interesting at the message that's delivered. Not just no one will lose their life, but the beginning of that, do not be afraid. It is that reassurance that was delivered to Paul by this angel. We can turn to the pages of the book of Revelation. We're not going to do that, but depicted throughout the book of Revelation on lots of different occasions. You see angels doing things specifically in heaven for God. That ministry in a lot of ways seems to take place behind the scenes, if you will, kind of behind the curtain. But the reality is even the visible activity of angels at the time of the early church seemed to be limited, that visible activity. But what about today? What can we take or what can be learned about maybe their activity today? I think there are a couple of passages that help us. One we've already read in Hebrews chapter 1. They are ministering spirits sent to minister. There are a couple other passages I want to draw your attention to. We're going to spend the rest of our time. The first is in Luke chapter 15. The second in Matthew chapter 18. So we're going to start in the Luke passage. We're going to spend most of our time in the Matthew passage. But in Luke chapter 15, we're going to look beginning in verse 8, and we're going to read down through verse 10. This is kind of, it is the middle parable 
of the lost things that Luke will make mention of here in Luke chapter 15, parables of Jesus. These lost things, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son in Luke chapter 15. I want you to look at what Jesus says about this lost coin, really direct your attention to verse 10, but we'll read 8, 9, and 10. He says, what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Verse 10, likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, there is something very specific for us here, and the joy that we're told the angels feel, even when one sinner repents. But I think in a little larger scale, the point can be made that when it comes to angels, there is concern for our well-being. Now, I don't want you to take 55 steps with that statement, Let's take just that one step, right? It's easy to take that statement that angels clearly, biblically, are concerned for our well-being, and 50 steps later, well, that certainly means this. Well, let's not take those 50 steps. Let's stay right where we are here, and we'll take another step to see if that gets us somewhere. So I want you to think of Hebrews chapter 1. They are ministering spirits sent to minister. Luke chapter 15, they are certainly concerned with our well-being. And now, I mean the big passage when it comes to this topic, Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, it is the guardian angel passage. Anybody that has a conversation about guardian angels, biblically, is going to reference Matthew chapter 18. And so I, I, let's, let's read it. Let's look at it together. Well, let's see if the point that is being made here is that each and every one of us as children of God have our own, whether you want to put it on your shoulder, whether you want to put it right behind you, whether you want to put it hovering a few feet above you, is Matthew chapter 18, is Jesus saying that each of us have our own specific and personal angel that is watching over us here in this world. Well, let's see what the text says. We're in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verse 10 is where it, the text is. We're going to expand that context a little bit. You shouldn't be surprised by that. And look beginning in verse 6. Key in verse 10, that's where we're going to spend our time. But we'll expand the context just, just a touch. Verse 6, Matthew chapter 18. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and, and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Now verse 10, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So the point that Jesus is making here in verse 10, or the question is, is there an angel with or on or behind or hovering above each of us who are children of God? This point, I want to spend a lot of time on the context, but the point that's being made here that each little child or, or child of faith, which as Christians we are, do we have a special angel who does special things for us in a special way? Well, first I want you to consider 
what the text says. If we are trying to take Matthew chapter 18 and verse 10 and painting the literal picture that what we have, each of us, is our own guardian angel who is with us, who follows us, who hovers with us, or sits on our shoulder. Think about what's said in the verse itself. The text actually says that these angels aren't here with us. They are with God in heaven. How do we know that? What does Jesus say? They always see his face. They always see his face. So I want you to think about this for a second. Do we think that here in Matthew chapter 18, that Jesus is teaching that each child of faith has a special angel who appears in God's presence or in some special way specifically intercede or is the point that he's making that angels take an interest in the welfare, welfare of God's people. Now, I want you, before you answer that question, I want you to consider that if it is yes to that second part, isn't there great comfort in that thought? I mean, if I, if I say uh, yes, so well, it's got to be the second one, not the first one. I guess we'll go with the second one. That sounds tremendous to me. That the angels take an interest in the welfare of God's people? That sounds fantastic. That is incredible comfort that can come to us. Now, here is the non-50 step answer. I think there's just a couple of steps that we can take on this. I think with the evidence and the text that we have, there's some belief and some thought process that we've got to get to. I think it's possible that in every way God can use angels as agents of his providence. I want you to look at one another passage in Romans chapter 1. It's an interesting passage in Romans chapter 1 that I do want to kind of direct your attention to. And this may not be 50 steps down the way, maybe 15 or 20. But I want you to look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, as Paul is writing at the very outset of this epistle, he, he says something really interesting. And I think in a lot of ways he's making reference to the providence of God. And he says in Romans chapter 1, beginning of verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now listen to what it says in verse 10. Making request if... By some means, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. And so the point that Paul is making here, he has, he has a great desire to be there in Rome with them. He's not been there and he, he wants to be there. And he says, if by some means that God and his will and the way that he operates and the way that he works, that I end up in Rome with you, fantastic. But maybe not. Now, nobody put in, maybe we're going to get it now, right? I mean, maybe we'll get it now. Nobody has put in the providence of, explain to me the providence of God question. Maybe 10 of you are writing that right now, and John will do a good job on that in a few months. But listen, listen, the providence of God is one of those things that I can answer in, in at least right now in like 30 seconds. When you ask me, listen, do you, what do you think about the providence of God I, today? God operating in the world today, I'll answer, yeah, I believe in that. Well, it, tell me how it works. And I'll say, I don't know all, I don't know how it all works. But think about the comfort that comes from that belief of saying, yeah, I believe God can and does operate in the world that I'm living in. How does he do that? I don't know how he does that. But guess what? He does lots of things that I don't know how he does it. And he has done tons of things that I don't understand how it works. But I'm telling you, there's incredible comfort in believing that God can operate in that way. And I think it is 
absolutely and in every way possible that he can use angels to even get that work done. How do we know that? Well, I'll tell you, we can know it in a lot of ways by studying books like Daniel, studying books like Revelation, where he used angels in the affairs of nations in both of those places, in both of those books. And because he's done it in the past, he certainly can do it now. And so what we have from their roles today are these few things. Number one, I think we can biblically say that they are concerned for our well-being as Christians. I think it can be said that God can use them as agents of his providence. There's one other thing. In Luke chapter 16, there's a story that Jesus tells. Again, an incredible comfort. In Luke chapter 16, in verse 22, a story that he's telling about a rich man and Lazarus and the death of those men and their interaction and the places that they find themselves in. And in Luke chapter 16, in verse 22, that now it says that when the beggar died and was carried by the angels, carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died and was buried. One of those lines sounds fantastic. The other, not so much. The man who was there focused on God was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Now we can have a conversation and a d- debate on is this story a literal story or is it a, a parable that Jesus takes? You can submit that question and John will cover that one as well. But no matter what side you come down on, what an incredibly comforting line that is. The beggar dies and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. What about the other guy? Well, he dies and he's buried. And so the picture that we have in every way, number one, concern for our well-being, for sure, and an incredible comfort that comes from that can certainly be used as agents in God's providence, companions for our eternal journey home. We can go to the book of Revelation as we've made reference to it. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 12, the picture is given of uh, guardians of the eternal city. All of those things, I believe, are biblically where we can be with angels in their work today. So a couple of final thoughts. Colossians chapter 2, I think Hebrews chapter 1 as well, puts us in a position that angels are in no way to be worshipped. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 18 through 19 specifically, that's made mentioned of. They are spiritual beings. They are higher than man. But they are in no way to be worshipped. Paul will make reference in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11 in a lot of ways by way of a warning at the power that our adversary has. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14, that he can even transform himself into an angel of light. And I think that what that does, it should put us in a position to know that our adversary, the devil, has incredible power and to be fully focused and in tune with what he's about all the time. I don't remember who put this first question in about angels today. I hope in the last couple of minutes here and in the time that we spent before, it's been helpful. And maybe for you, it's been helpful. Maybe you've got other questions that we can talk about with this. But I think for that question, biblically, it's about as far as we can go. Now, we can have maybe a private conversation. You can share all your speculations with me, and I'll smile and listen. But I think biblically, that's about as far as we can go. But don't fall short and say, well, that doesn't sound great. I really wanted a a hovering angel or one sitting on my shoulder. Let's not forget that these angels in heaven, concern for what we are and who we are and where we are, is an incredible comfort in and of itself. So hopefully this has been helpful for you tonight. Well, it's not a great segue to our invitation song, but Tim is going to lead us in that. He's going to lead us in a song that gives us an opportunity, as we had this morning, 
we made mention this morning, I specifically made mention, that when we sang that song of invitation, that it was an incredible opportunity because it was the opportunity that we have, and there was no promise of another one. But I'll tell you, here we are, and we have another opportunity, and I'll tell you why we have another opportunity. God's patience. That's why we have another opportunity, his love. And so he has blessed us with another opportunity. He's blessed us with this. But just as we said this morning, he's also promised that although he's patient, although he is long-suffering, although he loves us and is compassionate towards us, ultimately these opportunities will be gone. And how foolish it would be if we let an opportunity go and it was the last one. How foolish that would be. And what a scary thought to have on your mind for all of eternity. But here's an opportunity we have. And maybe we can help you in some way tonight spiritually with your relationship with God. If we can, you let us know as we stand and sing.